Just a word of caution, this podcast does contain material related to sexual assault, which could be upsetting to some listeners. Please make sure you're emotionally resourced and seek help from a trauma specialist or medical professional if you need it. I think women should get pensions. Women have been raped and sexually assaulted. There should be a pension that they receive as a result of the incredible harm that has entered their life and which changes the course of their lives forever, that of their children and other people around them. Hi, and welcome to Slut or Not, the podcast. Tell it to me straight, don't leave out a word, don't leave out anything you think I should have heard. I'm Kelly Shoker, and I'm the director of Slut or Not, the Diary of a Rape Trial, which is a feature-length documentary film exploring what it is like to report rape and following activist Mandy Gray as she fights to change how victims of sexual assault are treated by the criminal justice system. You can also find the show notes related to this episode on our site and more episodes of Slutter Not the Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and on our website at www.slutternut.ca. And if you'd like to share your own story of sexual assault, gender-based violence, or your expertise on the legal system or trauma related to sexual assault, and you'd like to be a guest on our podcast, please email us at slutornutthemovie at gmail.com. For today's episode of Slut or Nut, we chatted with Jane Doe. No, that's not her real name. We can't use her real name due to a publication ban, which was put in as a result of her testimony in the trial of the man who sexually assaulted her. And we're speaking with survivor, researcher, and writer Mandy Gray. You may recognize the voices of both women as they are both featured in the documentary film Slut or Nut, The Diary of a Rape Trial. I'd also like to add that since this recording, Mandy Gray has been sued for speaking in support of another survivor of sexual assault. Sued for supporting another survivor? Sued for tweeting? Sued for supporting a friend? What? Yes. So, in Vancouver, writer and former University of British Columbia professor Stephen Galloway has sued 20 different women, mostly students who he has never met including Mandy Gray, for tweeting and talking about him in their pursuit of supporting their friend who alleged that Mr. Galloway sexually assaulted her while she was a student. The lawsuit is going to trial, and the women being sued, again, mostly students and survivors of sexual assault, women working as activists in the field of sexual assault, are now facing legal costs and must hire lawyers to represent them in British Columbia, where most of them do not even live. So next time someone wonders why a woman doesn't report, well, you get the picture. Because if your rapist isn't found guilty, which only six at best out of every a thousand are, then homeboy can just turn around and sue you in a civil court. True story. The good news is if you would like to support the defense fund for the women in the trial, including Mandy, featured on this podcast today, Slut or Not will be donating the proceeds from any merchandise or DVD sales till December 31st. You can find that merch and the DVDs, and it's cool, guys. There's like tote bags and t-shirts and cool stuff. Um, You can find that on our website at www.slutternut.ca. And if you would like to just donate cash directly to the women who are running, who are having to now defend themselves in court for supporting their friend, um, you can go to their GoFundMe page, and that is at www.gofundme.com slash Galloway dash suit dash defense dash fund. And that name is G-A-L-L-O-W-A-Y. So GoFundMe.com backslash Galloway Suit Defense Fund, or if you go to our Slutternet Facebook page, you can also find the link to the GoFundMe there. All right, uh, let's hear now from Jane Doe and Mandy Gray. So I'm Mandy. Um, in one part of my life, I'm a PhD student at York University. I began my degree at studying the experiences of women in prison in Canada. And then that has since shifted uh, just through my own experiences of reporting and being processed through the legal system within the last year. So that's kind of been where most of my 
energy has been spent doing a lot of community-based organizing around sexual violence and um, the gaps within the legal system. Hi, uh, I'm Jane Doe, among many other things. Um, I'm the woman who sued the Toronto Police for negligence and gender discrimination of their investigation of my sexual assault, my rape. I was in court for 11 years and I won that case in 1998. Um, there's a lot of mythology about my case, what it accomplished and what it didn't. And so I wrote a book um, after that to try and you know put all the pieces together and take them apart again and throw them up in the air. And I'm going to read you a paragraph from a chapter called How to Survive a Rape Trial. It starts like this. There are a lot of things you should know about a rape trial, and you should probably understand them long before you are raped, if you are going to cope at all well. After you are raped, you are too vulnerable, too objectified, too victimized by what has happened to attempt to navigate a system of water so deep and currents so complicated they require a practice sailor to steer you through. Better you should chart those waters yourself before you have to jump in. But it's not a learning we take too easily or let to believe is a necessary part of our education. We believe, still, that rape is a matter between the perpetrator and his victim and that it does not affect us all, socially, in our systems, and how we live. Yeah. Such, you know, it's a catch-22 that just loops and loops and loops. And, you know, I, I like to say, if, you know, rape and sexual assault didn't exist, we have to invent it. It's a perfect tool of social control. It is the tool of it social is control. Exactly. Racism being another. Yes. Don't Homophobia. they work? In, they intersect with and one another. And they all intersect. You know, Absolutely. As you know, it's, it's interchangeable. We have no business crafting solutions until we understand that systemic nature. And I think the other problem is, too, is that we're trying to put this very unique crime into a predetermined legal system that was not designed to intervene in these cases. We have a legal system that is based on property. Exactly. And as you write in your book, property crime is held in higher regard than sexual assault. And so we have this patriarchal, misogynist, racist, classist, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, legal system. And then we just make minute, minor changes and seek to just apply it. But its foundations are inherently problematic. And that's why I've taken a strong stance against any reform. Domestic violence courts don't work. Any of these specialized violence courts are not going to address it because the root of the problem is within the institution of policing, within the institution of the criminal code. And within the institution of capitalism itself, right? Yes. If we want to get into a larger critique yeah, of better, capitalism. Yeah, better not go there, though. <laughs> no, I think that's beyond the scope. And I mean, capitalism's not going away, right? I mean, that is the systems in which we live and in which we function and in which we wage war on um, other countries. Um, and, and use rape as a tactic of and war. <laughs> where rape is used as that tactic of war. Other countries with, with black and brown people in them, in particular, I do talk to and happy to talk to a lot of women who've been raped or sexually assaulted when uh, and and there's things that I always you know start talking about based on my experience and the experience of others when I talked to Mandy I started I said um it's kind of a checklist right have you got your own lawyer check she had her own lawyer uh, have you thought about going to the media yes she had thought about going to the media have you thought about building a political agenda around it yes she'd organized and already begun that um that process so it was here was this woman i mean sh she became my hero and began um teaching me and like sharing a lot of information with me about that process i was so thrilled do you remember i was like i love you where have you been <laughs> <laughs> i know but then after realizing after, because I've done this for a year now, and realizing other women that come forward to me who are just so lost, I'm like, and you've done this for, what, 30 years? Yeah. And to hear the same narrative of, oh, I didn't think to take notes. No one told me. No one told me. You mean I can get my own lawyer? Yeah. And so I can understand your frustration when, and continuous frustration of not, of meeting these women that don't have the facts. So many women are living that, that reality of you know, lack of information in order to make informed decisions. And we know so much. It's not about Mandy or I or five other women holding this information. It's out there, but it's not disseminated. And that's willful 
and purposeful. I think it's so sad and that's why mm. I've been working so hard to make materials so people can find them online and be like, I should bring a witness. I need to, I need to take notes. I need to record things. And actually, you'll love hearing this. A, a woman reached out to me um, and she said, I just read Jane Doe's book. My stepmom called me. My dad just strangled her and she called me to tell me and I read Jane Doe's book and I pulled out my notebook and wrote down everything she said and she's like I think Jane Doe will be proud of me I love her (laughs) and I was like yes good keep taking notes keep supporting your stepmom and I mean it won't be an easy process but and you have to be political you have in to be political. In order to enter that political arena, feminist political analysis, anti-racist analysis, um, intersectional analyses, it saves your life. It certainly saved mine. And I believe you'd say the same thing. Yes. And then the other really problematic thing is you've got lawyers on the other side or crown attorneys or police officers saying, no, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. No, you can't. And who are you going to listen to? You know, you're in a really traumatized state for one thing, and you're fearful of these other players who are holding and keeping all the information and not telling you the truth about what you can do and you can't do. And a lot of that is because they don't know themselves mm-hmm. what women can do and can't do um, in a court of law when they've been uh, sexually assaulted. I went to go see my victim witness worker yesterday, and it was just like the nuisance that showed up at her door. And the really critical thing also I think we need to remember about victim witness is that um, those workers are employed by the police and the courts and they are accountable to them, not to the women involved. And I think this is an unfair disadvantage, again, in which you're not told, and if I hadn't retained my own legal counsel, Mm -hmm. is that anything you share with this support worker gets reported to the Crown, which in turn gets reported to the defense. Exactly. Do not call that person up pretending they're your therapist or a support worker. Because guess who gets the information at the end of the day? You're a rapist. Not to mention the financial barriers yeah. that the majority of women face. Yeah, exactly. And and I had to fight. Like I got my lawyer retained for me, but that's not because that's because I asked for it and mm-hmm. a lot of people don't even think to be like, I'm gonna hold this institution accountable and they're gonna pay for my lawyer. Mm-hmm. I and I had pro bono lawyers um, during my entire process. Yeah. So Jane Doe, do you want to talk uh, a bit about publication ban? Sure. And maybe parallel it from your time and who had the publication ban. And then for me, this many years later, and I'm saying, no way, I'm not doing it. So here's the deal. Because of the stigma, the shaming, and the danger raped or sexually assaulted women face when they do report, which of course most women don't, um, the court enacted the, our government enacted the publication ban, which in most cases um, guarantees the woman's anonymity and usually gives her the moniker Jane Doe. It is the law. In fact, it is a criminal offense to, um, for instance, use my real name or identify me through my real name or through any picture or likeness of me as Jane Doe or something similar to that. Um, and that is supposed to keep her safe from all of those uh, dangers, stigma, and shaming that she faces and encourage women to come forward. Um, It's not been effective. Women still don't come forward. Women are still shamed and still subject to stigma. And uh, I'm against, I don't think the publication ban works. I don't like it, as I cling to mine some 30 years later. Personally, for me, it's deeply political as well as personal. For one thing, I work in a lot of different sectors. Uh, I'm a public figure, I teach, I um, you know, work in the media and other capacities. If I were to come out as the Jane Doe that I became, it would be reported in the media. And all of those other identities I hold, all of those pieces about me would fall away and I would be the rape victim. I would be that woman. I would be that Jane Doe and that raped woman. And I absolutely refuse to take that mantle on. I will not hold that. I will not be part of the indignities that result from that, of the uh, casting of me as someone damaged, as someone um, who is very passive, who could take no no action. I will not be part of the language that's used to describe a woman who's been sexually assaulted. And uh, 
I refuse to take that role. It's just not something that I'm prepared to do, and I don't think it is the responsibility of women to take on that role. When you do, although I completely admired it, when you do, we must be mindful of the sort of stigma and shaming that women are subjected to by the media and in the cross-examination in court. But anything that, um, that comes up in cross-examination is not just reported by the media at the time, it's also public record. And any future employer can, if they choose, um, access that information. How do you think that, because within the last few years, a lot more women have come forward mm -hmm. and kind of owned this identity, if we want to look at, like, Bill Cosby, for example, mm -hmm. is a large example of those 49 women. Mm -hmm. Do you think there has been a shift in, in women rejecting this need for privacy? You know, I think, yes, certainly. Um, I'm very cautious about it. I'm, I'm even conflicted about it, as I've, as I've indicated. I think if we do look at Bill Cosby, the overwhelming majority of women involved did not come forward, did not use their real names, and actually cited the reasons <laughs> as fear of the stigma and the shaming and the danger, specifically at the time that they were uh, sexually assaulted and raped by Bill Cosby. Same deal went for the women who uh, were sexually assaulted by Gian Gomeshi. Yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm, I support it. Mm -hmm. I'm really interested in it. Um, I don't, I fear that we have not put enough information and pieces in place to guarantee the safety and the dignity of women who do use their real names. I think a key piece that you um, have talked about else t other times is this: the publication ban is actually benefiting the perpetrator more so than the individual because it, it keeps it s isolated. And, and anonymous. Anonymous and secret. And you sent me, uh, Jane Doe wrote a piece titled, Who Benefits from the Publication Ban? And after reading that piece, I went into my lawyer's office and I said, do not even dare ask me if I want a publication ban, and we will fight it tooth and nail because the legal system is also very paternalistic. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't even be surprised if the judge said to me, you know what, Mandy, we're going to put a publication ban on this because we don't want this to impact you. Absolutely. And I, I, I think that's a very real thing that could potentially happen. It has happened, and that is... Uh as was discovered in the research that I did. Mm -hmm. So the judge, as I said, it's, it, it's very misunderstood. The judge can tell you you have to have a publication ban, even if you don't want one. No, no, you don't understand how bad this is going to be, and this is going to take care of you, you know, and keep you safe. Now, another interesting piece is if I were to come forward right now and say to you on camera, you know, show my face, this is my real name, um, I'm subject to criminal charges. According to the law and the legislation, I have to go back to court and I have to petition that the uh, uh, publication ban on me be removed and, you know, use it against her in a court of law. But my reasoning, again, was, of course, very political in that Absolutely. I did not want him to get away with any of this. Mm -hmm. And I knew by having a publication ban, I wouldn't be able to, there would be, there would be the inability to link everything happening at York University to this case. And if there was a publication ban, those linkages could not be made. Absolutely. And shifting that shame and that guilt and that stigma from me Absolutely. onto him. And that was my rationale of why I thought it through. And to take pride in the work you've done. And I think what you said, Mandy, about, you know, if you're politicized and you're approaching it as a political action even, and understand the politics and the, the, the systemic nature of the trial of the legal system, you know, colonized women, um, women with, with, uh, who've been in conflict with the law, women with mental health histories, women who live in poverty, are much less likely to use their real names. If you're middle class, if you're educated, if you feel that you know you have good prospects already, you're much more inclined to use your, your real name. Or it's much safer for you to use your real name. Yeah. Um, when, or to report at all, obviously, when they've been raped and sexually assaulted. Why would you? Why the hell would you? Mm -hmm. I, if anyone asked me again, I would say it's up to you. I can't say one way or another in a lot of ways. I think taking on the Jane Doe provides a lot of safety. Yes. In, in that once you put your name out there and it's public record, there's no going back. But the bigger reason that women don't report is that we're not fucking stupid. We know it's going to happen to us. Yeah. Whether we use our real name or Jane Doe. Yes. 
which all goes to the medical pathologizing of women who've been sexually assaulted and the collusion of the legal system and the health system, which is perfect, whether it's the use of a psychiatrist as an expert witness, whether it's the rape kit, whether it's uh, your therapy records being seized, um, that collusion is perfect and complete. And then in terms of choices that you make, how much information are you going to disclose throughout it? Exactly. What are you going to, what are your boundaries and limits and how are you convinced that you're doing something and disclosing information that's going to help your case? Because in the moment, I thought disclosing particulars of my health history was of a benefit to me when in fact it's actually going to be used to mm -hmm. further discredit me as somebody who takes medication or used drugs or because I thought uh, it was in my best interest and it wasn't until after the fact that actually I should have withheld a lot more information than I had. Yeah. Um, Although they do, have way, they do have ways of finding that out anyway. <laughs> so I disclosed uh, my history of depression, of suicide attempts, I don't know why I decided to disclose that in hindsight. Would I? I don't think I would have. Probably I, because you wanted therapy, and how are they going to give you proper therapy if you don't know? Well, they had, did they not ask you? I was being a good person and being forthcoming with information, and I didn't want to be a difficult victim. I wanted to be helpful and... And you're in an untenable situation. You've been through, you've been raped or sexually assaulted. You're still experiencing the trauma and the aftermath of that. You're dealing with professionals that you've never met before. You're entering a system that you don't know about. So, of course, you're going to um, mm -hmm. tell the truth and think that they're there to help you. Yeah, and then now he has all that information. Do you advise women to, like, if a woman came to you and said, I've been raped, do you think I should report the crime? Would you say yes, go report it, or would you say no, go do something else? <laughs> I don't think... his name on social media, go find him and stand outside of his house with a megaphone. What, what do you advise? Do you want to hear what Nora told me to do? <laughs> she told me to get a Sharpie and graffiti all the bathrooms at York University. <laughs> <laughs> There's a response. Yeah. And certainly, I don't... I'm, no one, Mandy or I, we're not in positions that we're not about telling women what to do or what not to do. That's up to the individual woman. But she needs to be able to make an informed choice about what she's going to do. So the deal is you have to be present her with options and you have to inform her or him about what's going to happen if you do decide to enter the legal system, if you do decide to file charges. Um, I always try to ask, what do you want? And it's amazing, there's a pause, right? We don't really think about what we want because all of these other systems and all of these other things are in place as a result of coming forward or as a result of the act itself. So I try to ask women, what is it you want? Then I might make, um, I would make recommendations based on my history or experience and you know, other women in particular, other women in general, um, such as, um, have you thought about, you know, have you reported, did you undergo the kit? Just as you said, have you thought about getting your own legal representation? Because it is possible explaining the role of the Crown, which is not in any way to represent the woman involved in a court of law. Um, that is not the Crown's job, but we are misled to think that somehow that person is on our side. They are on the side of the state. They represent the queen, Regina, and that's the only woman that they represent in a rape trial. They are not there for you. So to explain how that system actually works um, so that the woman involved can make informed choices about getting her own lawyer, about going public, going to the media. Um, the reality is about reporting to their institution, their university, um, in so many cases, right? And understanding what's going to happen and what's not going to happen when and if you do that. And, sorry, I think the most important thing that we can do and what women really need the most, I think Mandy will agree, listen. Just listen, right? Just listen. No, and I think that's just it. If someone calls me and said, Mandy, I really want to proceed with this. I want to report. I would say go get a rape kit. It's not going to serve you any. It won't help your case at all. 
But if you want people to take you seriously, including the Crown, the investigators, the entire legal system, you're going to go get this kit. And not only that, if you want to get services, you're going to get that rape kit done because you'll get counseling sooner because you're more of a legitimate you enter the system. rape victim. Exactly. So if you guys could wave a magic wand and have a perfect universe, how would you change what happens after a woman report it what happens after a woman is raped not even reports but what happens after a woman is raped if you can wave a magic wand with a realistic the man would just drop dead right one option we were thinking about one thing that we should implement is that when our rapist gets arrested we should be getting a polaroid photo of his face when he hears the news (laughs) i think that's one thing we can do right away that would be good. <laughs> Just, you know, so we get some sense of justice. Absolutely. And, it, and then, fortunately, it's as limited as that. <laughs> yeah, like, it's like that's as low as I'm going in yeah. terms of... Or as high as you're going. Yeah, <laughs> this is going to make it, my process a little yeah, yeah. bit better. When he got that phone call... Hey, can you come in? Uh, you're under arrest for sexual assault. And then we're just going to do some paperwork and you'll be on your way in an hour. And I think for a lot of women that, you know, that is enough and that the best they're going to get is seeing Buddy under arrest, being shamed, being the center of attention in an open court of law. I don't think a lot of these rapists or offenders are even, they're, a lot of them are narcissists. Mm-hmm. They don't even think that they've done anything wrong. And this is like where I often struggle because although I would love to believe in rehabilitation, I don't know necessarily for the for sexual assault if it's applicable. Plus the conviction rate's 1%, so what is it we're actually talking about here anyway? Yeah, it's not, I'm moving away from this idea of reform because it's not working and it's just employing a lot of people and you know and as well as I know, we're not the ones getting hired. (laughs) exactly. An easier way maybe to look at it is uh, to look at cities where prisons uh, are located. Kingston, for example. The prison drives the economy of that entire city. Not just the prison itself, the jobs it recreates, all of the spin-off businesses and economies that it supports, hotels, motels, restaurants. Um, If we're going to uh, continue with that um, model, that American model, um, we better have crime. And, you know, we better have sexual assault. It's a crime that's committed all the time. Best we keep on letting it happen so that we can put more people in jail or, you know, just put more of the actors, the players, the cast in motion in the legal system. And unfortunately, we can thank a lot of the feminist movement for perpetuating that in terms of we need to lock these people up. Exactly. And taking this very carceral approach that jail is the response. But when we do imprison um, men who rape and who um, batter, um, these are men, for the most part, 80%, who, to whom the woman involved is socially or economically tied or um, emotionally tied, right? Take him away, there, his income is gone. The support in the family is gone. Um, it's, and it ends up being the woman who bears the brunt of all of that. Child care, all of that. Poverty. Poverty. Which leads to more violence, right? Yeah, losing housing, being kicked out of housing. I think what's really interesting to me is the sort of um, social shaming that we have seen of Bill Cosby. He's done. He's finished. He's lost... Um, everything, if not almost all of the things that he has accomplished or that he believes he has built. The same thing is occurring around Gian Gomeshi. Um, He has been publicly shamed. The chances of him returning to the position that he was in, or Cosby, are nil. So I think public shaming is really interesting. The person who has committed the crime, overwhelmingly men, must leave that community. They don't, they're not sent out to die and to starve, right? But they have to leave that community. They are no longer welcome in the place that they live and work and survive. And in order to return to the community, um, they have to do certain things. If they leave the community in this day and age where you can so easily recreate another identity for yourself, Absolutely. move to another big city, be anonymous, 
isn't leaving the community just allowing them to go and potentially do that in a new community? Absolutely. My own case, like I've had to come to terms with, yeah, he can go create a new life somewhere else. But you know what? I'll take it if he's if he's shamed out of my program, out of the program, out of York University, out of Toronto even. I'll take that. Mm -hmm. I think women should get pensions. Women have been raped and sexually assaulted. There should be a pension that they receive as a result of the incredible harm that has entered their life and which changes the course of their lives forever, that of their children and other people around them. So pensions, very, very uh, interesting idea. Yeah, one woman offered to tabulate all of my receipts and all of my bills from taxi rides to therapy mm -hmm. to going to mis for like massages because yep. that was like a trauma response for me. Mm -hmm. Just like even the things that you wouldn't necessarily immediately associate, but like this aftermath and this economic yeah. that incurred. And obviously that's a very like middle class idea too because these things are things that I'm able to expense or put onto my line of debt, but I wish we had an answer. Um, I think what, you know, is more interesting to look at is what do we do before the crime has occurred. So one thing, you know, and it's not just one individual thing, but I really like the idea of sex education as a tool and a method to stop and to arrest uh, rape and sexual assault, looking at them as, as a continuum and addressing traditional understandings of masculinity, for instance, and as well as femininity. Why are we socializing our baby boys um, who are born free from any kind of malice or understanding of violence to then understand violence as natural, as part of their psyche and their penises or their dicks to be the organ that drives their lives and determines what they're going to do and what they're not going to do, especially around... Uh, uh, women or other men, depending on um, you know your sexual um, uh, orientation. So that's one thing that we need to be looking at. We're not doing that. We need to be looking at the feminization of women. Why are we socializing girls and young women and adult women to uh, accept that we will be raped and sexually assaulted? What, so those two pieces have to be looked at. Good sex ed starts at about the age of two or three. You know, if we start talking about rape and sexual assault at really young ages and what's wrong with it and, you know, what's going on, as opposed to ignoring it, because we do know that our children as young as five, as young as nine, are being raped and sexually assaulted, as young as three, as young as two, as young as infants, are experiencing those crimes. But we're not going to talk to them about it. We're not going to tell them you know, what to do when it happens and all of the information. And we're not going to believe them need. when they tell and us. And we're sure as hell not going to believe them when they do tell us. So we're, you know, we, we come at so many things backwards, and that's one of the things. We do not understand the nature of the crime, of sexual violence. We don't understand the nature of the harm, and uh, we're not invested in doing that. And I think really good sex ed would be one large step towards that and towards preventing. I agree. The end. Thanks, guys. And again, if you would like to help contribute to the Legal Defense Fund for the survivors of assault who are being sued by Stephen Galloway, you can purchase Slutter Nut merchandise or a DVD from our website at www.slutternut.ca, or you can donate to the fund directly, and the link is on our Slutter Nut Movie Facebook page. Thank you so much, and please remember, if someone discloses a sexual assault to you, please listen and support them. Thank you.